Good. So let's talk about the two most essential components to strength training. The first is, the, the, before I started, there is no objective way to quantify what we're getting ready to talk about. Everybody is mesmerized by the amount of weight that they're putting on a bar. That is an external exhibition of an internal process. Your strength is a process of you deciding to move a thing and then there's an external holy shit. I see that person moving that thing. Equals strength, right? Let's not get more complicated than that. But the problem is, is, is the how you are doing it. Longevity of doing it, being 50 years old and getting stronger, is a process of a practice, of training, of mindful approach to that. Meaning we have to understand at the root of everything that we're doing, how and why we're doing it. The first thing that we're going to talk about today is a brace. Okay, Bracing basically means there is tension in my body and I'm creating it. There's no external load on me whatsoever. I am creating my own tension inside of my own body. Before I do anything, jumping jacks, push-ups, I don't care what it is, sitting down, standing up, you should have some amount of tonus, some amount of tension on the body. Now specifically, the best way that we can do that, especially in the gym, is to mindfully organize, constantly organize, where is my body in space at all times? From the top down, starting with our head position, that head is neutral. Just go through the checklist with me, all right? We're getting ready to blast the space shuttle off here, right? Should we just flip a switch and ignite the motherfucker and let it go? Probably right? Not. We want a systems check because we saw back in the 80s how that go when you stop looking at <laughs> details, right? So head, neutral. Just stand in one space and stay with me for a second. See if you can get the little squirrel, right? And this is the, this is the problem that I have with everybody is everybody comes into a session and they want to burn calories. They want to get pheromones kicking. They want heart rate out the ass, right? You want to fix. You want to crack pipe. We're going to train and we're going to practice from this point forward. There is no more just movie, movie, goosey, goosey, having fucking fun, shooting the shit, letting out hormones. Orange Theory does that, right? We care about how you're doing things. Now, head position. There's a lot of conversation about where the eyes should be during training. With a barbell, with most dumbbells, most, and even the cable machine, if the head is neutral and I start to hinge and my back is moving more horizontal to the floor, what are my eyes doing? Should they stay fixed? They scroll inside of my skull down and they scroll up. So the perfect example of that is your Romanian deadlift. Head is neutral. I bend over. I hinge. My eyes scroll down. I'm looking at the floor. My eyes scroll up. Now contrast that to the exact opposite setup with a kettlebell swing. I'm, I'm basically in the same position. But can I now let my eyes go up and down? The answer is no. Why? Because this is a violent movement. It's very fast. So if you are quickly moving from floor to ceiling, floor to ceiling, floor to ceiling, what's going to happen? You're going to pass out, right? So in a swing, I need some amount of extension in my neck and my eyes are fixed so that as I'm moving through it, I'm not getting dizzy. Keep that in the back of your head. There is no golden rules. There's best practices. Okay? All the way down, shoulder blades are retracted, so everybody do it, practice it. Head position is neutral, shoulder blades are contracted and back. Okay? What happens to the lower back when you do that? It goes into extension. It goes into hyperextension. Yeah. Okay? How do we correct that? If that's going into hyperextension, the bottom of my floating ribs and the ASIS, the top of the hip, are they getting closer or further apart? Further apart. 
If I'm doing barbell training, if I'm doing resistance training, do I want them as far apart as possible or as close together as I can get them? Close. How do we hold the T-spine in place, then bring the floating ribs down? Tighten. You tighten your abbeys. Right? We can use the term core, but we get lost in it. Contract your abs. Give yourself a little gut check there. Okay? Nice and tight. 99.9% .9 of the time, no matter what it is that you're doing, the abs are tight. If the abs are tight, how easy is it to get into hyperextension? It's hard. You oh. cannot do both at the same time. Therefore, two good cues to think of. If I say pull your shoulder blades back and you guys are excessively tight in your chest and your T-spine is weak, what are the chances you're going to ignite a neurological process to get there? It's probably not going to happen. But if you think about sticking your chest out, everybody do it. Stick your chest out. Look how big you get, right? Now stick your chest out and squeeze your abs. Now we've got the upper body locked in. This is how we're going to train everything we do. Now, very easily, all we're going to do is bypass the hip, go right into the feet, and take your heels and screw them into the floor together. So there's two things that are happening. When I screw my feet, my heels especially, into the floor, put your hands on your body. What do you feel? Tight. Okay, what part specifically gets tighter? I mean, it's all tighter, but what part do you feel like pop out? Bottom or middle? The top, the medius. If you put your hands here, you're gonna feel the glute max turn in, and you'll feel that medius, boom, go up. What happens to your spine? when you screw your heels together. Do you get shorter or taller? Taller. It's pushing you into extension. This in the strength industry is what we call a clue. This is a clue. So should I be relying on my back muscles to hold me up or my glutes? Glutes. When I'm standing, what should I be firing? The glutes. I should be screwed into the floor. Now we're into a concept, there's two ways of getting it, called torsion where instead of just relaxing and sitting on the bones, where I'm just hanging on ligament, connective tissue, I'm going to take the guy wire system, the muscles, and create torsion. So I'm taking my femur and I'm screwing it into the hip. So now it is tight. It is ready to load. The shoulder is the same way. If I'm relaxed and hanging and trying to move in this manner, right, Especially if you're swinging belts, you're doing a snatch like that, oh my god, it's a terrible feeling. You're just getting your arm ripped out of socket. I need to take it and create torsion in the glenohumeral uh, socket, right, and pull my T-spine in, and now that humerus is set in that socket and it's ready to play. Now just practice that for a little bit, but I want you to do this. Keep your feet close together because we're getting ready to take it to the floor, and we're going to do a plank, okay? So what I want you to do is to bring your arms up in front, just like you're setting up a plank. Look straight in between your hands. Head is neutral. Shoulder blades are contracted. Back. Chest is up. Squeeze your abs tight. Pull your heels together. And hold on to that for 10 seconds. See if you can make yourself pass out. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this plank and we're going to weaponize it. Okay, so instead of just doing planky planky and hanging out, we're going to turn this into the metaphor for how we are going to lift everything, right? And we're actually going to take this, once we start setting up the lifter's wedge, we're going to take this to the extreme. I just talked about a concept called irradiation, where every single muscle in your body is contracting. Okay, if I'm swinging a kettlebell with one hand and this arm is relaxed, is this linkage or leakage? Am I linking all my energy together and propelling my body into this one magnificent movement? Or am I leaking it if everything else is tight? Leaking. We're leaking. You must wrap that around your noodle. That is concept number one. It's what we're talking about. You are a kinetic chain. In a metal chain to make it tighter, I pull it apart. In the kinetic chain, what do I do? Do I pull it apart or push it together? Push it. We're going we're gonna to play with that concept. So what I want you guys to do is just come down to the floor on your forearms. Don't get too hyper-technical with it. Just do what you think is your best plank. Ten seconds.
<clears throat> it's probably one of the most boring things that you could do and one of the most effective. So if you want to come in, once again, a little early, would it be good to just do a little yoga or do a 15-minute fucking plank? <clears throat> good answer. Now, gently bring your knees down. So uh, come up on your knees so you can see me like you're standing up. So you can see me, right? That means you grip. So, what I want everybody to do is to squeeze your fists and get as tight as possible. Bring your shoulder blades all the way up and shrug. Like you've got 500 pounds, you're shrugging 500 pounds. With the same 500 pounds, the same intensity, I want you to do anti-shrug. Not passively, do it again. Up, aggressively, squeeze everything. Push down hard. Do you feel your lats? Uh, against the tricep. Mm -hmm. Squeeze your triceps. Squeeze your lats. Keep finding that more. Now squeeze your abs. Okay? Now we're going to turn the lats on in this plank. So as you guys come down and set this up again, when you get ready to go, I want to see you pull and, and create friction on the floor with your forearm and pull your lats into place. And again, hold it for 10 seconds. Okay? Go through the same process, head is neutral, shoulder blades are back. Now we're just activating lats. Your lats are the cable, the guide wire system. They are attaching and communicating the upper and lower torso. No lat, you can forget it. It's a big old awesome muscle. Bring your elbows a little bit forward directly under your shoulder. And it may help when you guys start this to be slightly forward so that when you pull, your elbows are in proper alignment. The humerus is in a 90 degree angle. It's not in any kind of increased angle. Feel those lats. Tighten your abs against them. Nice tight body. Really nice. Good. All right, bring your knees down. Come up again. All right. So now we just hooked up the upper body, the linkage in the upper body. We're making fists. We're pulling our lats into place, shoulder blades are retracted. The next thing we're going to do is once you set that up, we're going to take our toes and pull against the floor. And again, you may need to be a little bit forward so that when you do this, your body packs together. We know you're doing this correctly because every single muscle in your body is going to be shaking. I am not calling time on this one. I, got, I want you guys to go and I want you to create so much irradiation, meaning every single muscle in your body is tight. Jaw is clenched, okay? If you are breathing, you're doing so subtly under the shield. Itty bitty little nostril breaths, okay? So, set this up and I want you to go until you shake and fail to the floor, okay? Go for it. Welcome to Barbell 101. It's boring. Yeah. Pull your toes in tight. Squeeze your glutes. So I want you to think about tuck, tighten, and then pull everything together. Tuck, tighten, pull. Tight, tight, tight. Everything you got. Keep going. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that concept. Everybody feels it, right? Whew. Yeah. Right? It should. Right. Yeah. When you get done, if you've done it correctly, you should feel the parasympathetic nervous system coming in. And you should feel a little drowsy. Now when you get done, it's so you're firing so much nerve. They're, you're firing so much. And at the end of the day, that, that is the exhibition of strength. Is how well can Jimmy get Jimmy's mind to get Jimmy's nervous system that's connected to Jimmy's muscles? To fire at one time. Strength is not a product of a cruel. It is not what everybody keeps thinking it is, where I, I lift a weight ten times and I get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Your strength has always been there. And we know it because if we flip your truck over top of your children, what's going to happen to said truck? You're going to flip the fucking truck over, right? Did you do, what kind of weight training did you do to do that? And we see this all the time, right? We can't objectify it because nobody's there with an EEG machine when, when trucks flip over on children. But we hear about these things all the time, right? How do people do that? Because when you have to, you can call upon 
all that firing. You can say muscles, go, right? Why doesn't our body just give us that all the time? What would happen if you could call upon that strength level at any given time with no training? Be Superman. You know, you would turn into an amoeba and your body would explode. Ah. Your body intuitive, right, Doc? You with me? Your body intuitively knows to only give you so much because your connective tissue, the discs, etc., are not ready to receive that kind of load. Training is not a process of getting stronger. It's a process of becoming uninhibited. The more you practice with weight, the more your nervous system starts to get educated and say, you know what? Jimmy's doing his job. Let's give him a little bit more. When you've done it for 30 some years, I can probably call upon 90% of my total strength capacity, but there's 10% in there that I will never get unless shit is truly hitting the fucking fan. The best strength athletes in the world, right? When I was doing uh, uh, the uh, SFG, the kettlebell thing, there's a five minute snatch test. You guys have never done it. I won't do it to you because it's fucking extremely brutal. It's horrible. It, only, it not only takes a lot of technical experience, you're at max heart rate in the first 20 seconds. Therefore, for four minutes and 40 seconds, you were doing something incredibly technical for a long period of time, all right? When I was down there, I got done relatively soon. When I got done, I turned around and I started screaming and yelling at everybody, get fucking mad! Go, motherfucker, get mad! You're watching all these Hindu cows swinging kettlebell with this delightful face. When we got done, all these people came up to me and they were like, I, I, was, I was like, Use your anger, you know, get mad at it. Anger is a gift. Why? Why? Because the best strength athletes in the world understand that creating a state of mind, this emotional state of mind, corresponds to this. Can I be happy and in love with the universe and deadlift? <laughs> Fuck no. Should I be angry and do yoga? No. It's a state of mind. I have choice. The best strength athletes in the world know how to call upon absolute total fury and put it into a single repetition. Okay? This is, at the end of the day, what you need, how you need to be thinking as we're approaching the barbell. So the point is when we get done with that one rep, every single nerve in your body, no matter if it's 115 on the floor or 1015, I'm firing the same amount of muscle tissue. Therefore, is the weight primary or secondary to what I am doing in strength training? Secondary. Fucking A. Right? When the weight becomes primary, what happens to technical proficiency, the mental cues that need to be in place, and also your ability to understand and know where you are in space at any and any and all times. It's all gone when you start chasing weight on the bar. Okay? You do those other things correctly, the weight on the bar will go up. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take that plank, the radiation, all these muscles that I'm firing and using, turn the guide wire system on to keep me safe and to allow my movement to be effective, especially when I'm talking about training or, or with weight. When we set up the lifter's wedge, we're going to take that and we're going to turn it on times five, right? So as tight as you guys were in the plank, we're going to go down in the bottom position and you've not done it correctly until you pass out, okay? When we set up the deadlift, we're going to do a conventional style. We're going to be about an inch away. When you stand up, I immediately want you to think about having that weight in your body. You're already trapping the nervous system. If I had a heart rate monitor on, you would see my heart rate already starting to go up because I'm visualizing what I'm getting ready to do. I'm already starting to get a little pissed off. Okay? Abs are tight. I'm planking inside. I'm already tight. I'm breathing under the shield. I'm not passively coming down to the floor. I am already tight, things are turned on, I'm prepping. Hinge and do not let the shins go. We're going to turn the hamstrings on and get them tight. As I'm coming down, we're going to do a double over grip. Now, slowly, 
I'm going to pull my heels together. Start to squeeze the bar. Gently bring the knees toward the bar until my shin barely makes contact. From here, I'm going to breathe in deeply as though I'm going underwater for five minutes. And as I do, I'm going to retract my shoulder blades, pack my lats in and back like we did with the, the plank. There's two things happening with the back. The shoulder blades are coming back. The lats are pulling them down. It's not one or the other. It is both. Once again, circular rotational forces create torsion. Torsion is stronger than tension. Okay? So as I retract, breathe deeply. And I'm going to stay here and hold, 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 hold. When I can't hold it any longer, I'm going to stand up as though I still have the bar in an explosive movement. Stop at the top. We're going to work on that a little bit. All right. You're going to come around the front. Go ahead and stand up real quick, Greg. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a girth hitch around the center. Okay? What we're going to do is my buddy's going to walk up. He's going to set this up. Okay? Don't raise the bar off the floor. Go ahead and walk up to it. Start to get set. Okay? Everything is tight. We're setting up that wedge. Before I pull, before I squat, before I do anything, if I'm working this wedge, I do so for about three seconds. One, not one, two, three. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. A good wedge, especially in the deadlift, means the more I'm wedging, what starts to happen to the floor? Or I'm sorry, the bar. It starts to come up. It starts to come up. All right? Why wouldn't I want to relax and just get tight and pull it? Because of that motherfucker Newton, right? Who basically created this thing where it says, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. reaction. Now, the equal opposite reaction with deadlifting, which I'm standing up with the bar, is what? The bar is coming down to the ground quickly. If I yank on it and start to pull, what equal opposite action takes place? Gravity pulls it the other way, and you see this because people will pull it, they'll get tight for a nanosecond and rip it, and then what happens? There's actually more load than they started with, and it pulls their spine out of place. So why would I set all this up to just jerk this bar and go? The lifter's wedge is not only the best, best solution for getting you stronger with longevity and keeping you pain-free, right, injury-free, it in and of itself is a better technical process to move away than to just jerk it. So we need to practice it. And the way we're going to practice it, you guys are going to go down, do your normal setup, and then stay down there and get super tight. And then, our, and then Buddy is going to take this band and start pulling it away. And I want you to just sit there and burn. Sit there and burn. All right, tight, tight, tight. Don't lift it off the floor. Just stay tight. Just stay tight. There you go. Don't let your buddy have it. Keep coming. Keep tugging at it. Keep going. There you go. Keep going. Keep pulling it, Polly. Make it harder on him. Make it harder. Fuck him. Yeah. Three, two, one. Switch with your body. The plank. And combine them into the squat. Now I'm going to do the first set wrong. I'm going to face out so you guys can see me as I'm setting this up. Then I'm going to do it again facing in so we can all see the mechanics, okay? So, um, so many times, not just with you guys, I watch a lot of uh, power liftings, world record holders, what are they doing, what are the secrets to success? You'd be amazed at how much sloppiness there is, especially in setting up the squat, okay? The more irradiation, the tighter I get, the lighter this bar is gonna become. The biggest difference between the squat and the deadlift, not just mechanically, is the danger. If I get in trouble with the deadlift, what do I do? Drop it. I drop it, weightlifting the same way. As you're learning Olympic weightlifting, the very first thing you learn how to do is to get rid of that bar. 
right? There's no spotting. It's not safe to spot in weightlifting. In squatting, it is, okay? But the issue is setting it up, walking out, and this bar is sitting on top of you, all right? If you get in trouble with it, and I've seen it, I've seen world-class Ed Cone setting it up, quarter way into the squat, a little bit of valgus, total hip, fucking spine, hip fracture, God, you name it. Anyway, not to scare you, but it is dangerous. It is the most dangerous movement we're probably going to do in here. Therefore, it should always be done first. If you're doing it with load, you should be really paying attention to it and not supersetting anything. A lot of times if I'm squatting, I will start by supersetting and activating. I'll do some swings, planks, whatever, single legs, whatever i got to do. But once I get into my working sets, man, it's, it's surgery. It is, it is a scalpel. It is precision. And there's no fucking around with it whatsoever. The better I get at that precision, much like a foul shot. Tip has done a lot of sports psych with basketball players. If, if I have a setup in my foul shot, I'm in the final Sweet 16, right? 50,000 people around me, 5 million people watching it. If I do that setup, and normally I dribble the ball three times, one, two, three, and I dip, shoot. The one time I walk up and I, I, I dribble it twice, boom, boom, and I do two dips. What's going to happen? You miss. You're going to fucking miss. Why do we freeze punters? <laughs> to get off this side. Oh! You get into their heads, right? So the squat, the deadlift, if you look at how we what we just did, right? I'm giving you guys a ritual. I've got my own ritual. Every single time. You think for after 35 years of hinging, I need to touch my hip and move back to know it's there? No. It's a ritual. And the one time I don't do it, what's gonna happen to that lift? 35 years of touching my hip and hinging, right? Every little thing is the Japanese tea ceremony. We must treat this with respect, okay? So, the first thing that you're gonna notice about low bar back squatting is it hurts. It hurts your shoulders. It hurts to put it in the right position. So, to keep it from hurting, what do we do? We put it in the wrong position. We turn it into a high bar squat. I don't put anything on that area back there called the C-spine. Mm -mm. In martial arts, in, in old school martial arts, Daikaru Aikyu Jiu Jitsu, old school Japanese arts, every single technique they did ended in one thing, a strike to the back of the head. Why do you suppose they did that? More nerves and more sensitive. To ball. kill the motherfucker, <laughs> right? They didn't hit him in the liver, they didn't kick him in the balls. They got him face down, and deliver a blow to the back of the neck because that was it. It's that easy to injure yourself, and Doc will testify to that. The last place you want to be injured is your C-spine, okay? Because what will it affect? Everything. Everything below it, so the bar doesn't go there. This is why I hold my head in a neutral position. If I'm flexing it or extending it too much, this is bad. The effect happens all the way down the body. So when you start to squat, you need to find a position with your hands that doesn't kill your shoulders. As I warm up with the squat, my hands begin to move in. Okay? Stretching can help. This is one of the times that, yeah, stretching the pecs is a good idea. I'll take a stick and rotate over my head, all kinds of fun stuff. Pull apart to help with that. Okay? And again, your cue is chest up. So as I begin this, I'm going to find exactly where my hands are going to go. I'm going to start on the ring. I'm going to stare at the center of the bar. Okay? If I'm deadlifting and not paying attention to where I set up and one hand is over here one hand is over there, and I start to deadlift, what's going to happen to that bar if it's not even? Not a good idea. Everything is precise with this guy. So as you walk in, stare at the center of that, put your head on it. Dive under, and then slowly try to find, there's a groove back there, under the trap, on the top of the scapula, it's called the spine of the scapula. That's where we're trying to put this thing, it's a natural groove that lives there. Now if I bring my elbows up too high, it, I create a bigger shelf. If I bring them too low, 
they go away. The problem is the higher I get, the less lat I can activate. Raise your arms and do it. I gotta find a spot there where there's two things. And again, it's never one way or the other. It's a combination where I'm creating torsion, right? I got to find the lat, I got to get tight, but it's not one or the other. It's a mix of two things. I'm retracting in and I'm also pulling down with my elbows. I want to get as tight as possible. From here, I'm going to take a breath. Now, mind you, I'm going to walk forward, always walking out. I never want to back into the rack, okay? Head is neutral, big air. <gasps> Brace. When I do this, no muscle should be contracted. All I'm doing, how much could I lift from here to here? A lot. More than a squat? Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. What if I'm back here? No. It doesn't make any sense, right? I want my center under the ball. I'm going to breathe, brace. Now, normally I back out six inches max. I'm just going to take a little step forward, come out of the rack. Now, one, two, three, four. We want to take as little steps as possible, but it needs to be precise. If you take less steps than that, the width or length of the stride is increased and it becomes very dangerous. This is maximum load, okay? And again, I'm gonna slowly, I'm still holding my breath. I'm gonna slowly let it out and hold on to the shield. Before I get ready to squat, inhale deeply. You'll see the bar rise. Now, drive the ribs and hip together. The first motion has got to be from the hip. Hip hinge. The bar is still over the center of the foot. I'm sitting back as far as I possibly can without moving the knee. Now, my knees begin to flex. Now, there's one other thing left behind. I'm going to abduct. What happens to, to my hip? Drops lower. Again, one motion. Hip hinge. Bar is over the center of the foot. Now I start to flex a little bit. Open, and you see the hip drop. Down, I'm going to back up. Move in. Okay? If I'm only hinging and flexing, that's as far as I can get that squat. I've got to create again, what's my magic word? Abduction. It's abduction, but what am I doing in my hip? Torsion. Torsion. I'm putting that femur, uh, I'm screwing that femur in there. And as it's doing that, it increases my range of motion. It allows me to get down deeper into a more effective functional squat, which includes more muscle fiber, makes me more mobile, more flexible, and stronger, restores your natural mobility that should all be in there. And at the same time, does my back angle. If I hinge, the bar is here. It can't move forward or back, right? My knees go forward. Now as I start to abduct and I go deeper, does my back angle change? No. No. If I keep my shins vertical, and this is what you see a lot of people try to do, it's only hinge. Keep the tibia straight. If I do this and I get below parallel, what's my back angle now? And I'm starting to butt weak. I can feel it. Is my back angle greater? Less. 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 Flat. It's more. Yeah, it's greater. Whatever is flat. I'm moving towards 90 degrees oh, yeah. toward the floor. Yeah. Am I stronger here or here? There. There. Full time. Right. Okay. So I'm going to do it one full time and then I'm going to let you guys go. Okay? So let's put Greg and Jimmy on this one. Polly, you over there. Okay. Yeah. Try to stand straight up. Think about the beginning when we were planking, right? Head, shoulders, chest is up, abs is tight. Now all the way through the floor, screw your heels together. Screw them together. Tight. Tight. You feel your medius turn on? Now your hand starts from there. Now go. Okay? 
but you're arching. Come right back up. Screw your heels together. Tight. Tight abs. Now hinge. Hold it. Tight, tight. Sit. 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 Come right back up. Do it again. Screw your heels together. Feel that? See it? Yep. See how the bar got lighter? Okay. Chest up. Tight abs. Tight, tight, tight. Screw your heels together. Now, see how immovable he is? That's the feeling underneath the bar. You gotta give each other a little tough love. He should not be moving. That ass is rock hard. So he's in a straight line. So when he hinges, the fulcrum is right there. It's not arching. We don't want to move the fulcrum here in his lower back. Understand? We want to move the entirety, this whole lever. I want to move it back. Tight abs, screw your heels together. Big air. Woo. Go. Boom. Set, set, set. Now knees go forward. Hold on to all of it. Much better. Squat. It's a lot better, right? Mm -hmm. All right, do that for each other. All right, get Greg in the belly. I'll hit you too, Paul.